to not Modi to Russia. Russia ready for Prime Minister Narendra Modi's anticipated July visit. Plans are underway amid growing anticipation and diplomatic preparations. Assange freed. WikiLeaks found Julian Assange pleads guilty to violate US espionage law and marks the end of his 14-year legal saga, allowing him to return home. Presidential showdown. Biden and Trump prepares for the first 2024 debate rematch. The event underscores the intense rivalry and strategic maneuvering in the lead up to the next presidential election. And on to the finals. Top teams vie for final spots in the ICC T20 World Cup knockout stage amid intense competition. Excitement peaks as Afghans make a historical entry into the semis. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Avadarna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Vinuth Varnasuriya. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. Some key stories are lined up to report to you tonight and we start off with an important announcement by the Kremlin. Russian media state reported that Kremlin announced Russia and India are preparing for a visit by the Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi to Russia. Additionally, a diplomatic source suggested that Modi may visit in July. The Kremlin said in March that Modi had an open invitation to come to Russia and that meeting with President Vladimir Putin would take place. Russia has had strong ties with India since the Cold War and New Delhi's importance as a key trade partner for Moscow has grown since the Kremlin sent troops into Ukraine in February of 2022. China and India have become key buyers of Russian oil following the sanctions imposed by the US and its allies that shut most Western markets for Russian exports. Under Modi's leadership, India has avoided condemning Russia's action in Ukraine while emphasizing the need for a peaceful settlement. Modi's visit follows his re-election for a third straight term. He last visited Russia in 2019 for an economic forum in the far eastern port of Vladivostok. He last travelled to Moscow in 2015. India has not yet confirmed the Russian operations in Ukraine and it has been maintaining that the crisis must be resolved through diplomacy and dialogue. India and Russia are both members of the BRICS group of countries. India, the world's third largest crude consumer, has been a major buyer of discounted Russian oil since the Kremlin's 2022 invasion of Ukraine and has deep economic and political ties with Moscow. The dead toll from a series of brazen attacks on churches and synagogues in Russia's mainly Muslim region of Dagestan rose to 20 after gunmen went on the rampage in coordinated attacks in two of the republic's most important cities. A day after a series of brazen attacks on places of worship in Russia's Dagestan, a synagogue continues to smolder. The mostly Muslim region announced three days of mourning on Monday after gunmen went on a rampage there in coordinated assaults on two of the republic's most important cities. The death toll has risen to at least 20. Here's Sergei Melikov, the governor of the Dagestan region. Today has become a day of tragedy for Dagestan, and not only for Dagestan, but for our entire country. Unprecedented in their cruelty, terrorist attacks were committed today against religious sites in the capital of Dagestan, Makachkala, and our ancient city of Durban. Melikov added that authorities understand who is behind the organization of the attacks, adding that foreign forces had been involved in preparing the assault. He did not give details and there has been no immediate claim of responsibility. Attackers with automatic weapons burst into an Orthodox church and a synagogue in the ancient city of Durban on Sunday evening. They set fire to an icon at the church and killed 66-year-old Orthodox priest Nikolai Kotelnikov. In the Caspian city of Makachkala, around 75 miles north, attackers shot at a traffic police post and attacked a church. Gun battles erupted around the Assumption Cathedral in Makachkala, with heavy automatic gunfire ringing out late into the night. At least five of the attackers were killed, and Russia's investigative committee said the majority of those dead were policemen. Dagestan is made up of a patchwork of ethnic groups, languages and regions that live in the shadow of the Caucasus Mountains between the Caspian Sea and the Black Sea. President Vladimir Putin, who has long accused the West of trying to stoke separatism in the area, expressed condolences to those who lost relatives via his spokesman, Dmitry Peskov. 
The attack on Christian and Jewish places of worship has stoked fears Russia may be facing a renewed militant Islamist threat just three months after a deadly attack in Moscow. 145 people were killed at the Crocus Concert Hall in March. Islamic State claimed responsibility for that attack. On to some legal matters now. WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange has been freed from prison in the United Kingdom and is set to travel to home in Australia after he pleads guilty to a single charge of breaching the espionage law. According to the filing in the US District Court for the Northern Mariana Islands, Assange will plead guilty to one court of conspiring to obtain disclosed classified UN national defense documents. After five years fighting US extradition from a top security UK jail, Julian Assange appeared to be boarding a plane that WikiLeaks says is flying out of the United Kingdom in footage it released Tuesday. He's expected to appear in court on the island of Saipan Wednesday evening and plead guilty to violating US espionage law in exchange for his freedom. WikiLeaks shared a video of Assange's wife, Stella, outside London's top security Belmarsh prison. Julian was kept there since 2019 and she had made many visits over the years to see him. Filings in the US District Court for the Northern Mariana Islands say Julian Assange agreed to plead guilty to a single count of conspiring to obtain and disclose classified US national defense documents. In 2010, WikiLeaks released hundreds of thousands of classified military documents on Washington's wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, and troves of diplomatic cables. The court on Saipan is expected to sentence Assange to 62 months of time already served, crediting Assange's time in prison in London. This would let him avoid being imprisoned in the United States and be left free to return to Australia after the proceedings. Assange was indicted during former President Donald Trump's administration over WikiLeaks mass release of documents. Julian Assange's supporters have long criticized the use of charges typically levied against federal government employees in Assange's case and press freedom advocates argue criminally charging Assange is a threat to free speech. China has become the first country to gather samples from the far side of the moon and bring them back to Earth in a landmark achievement. A re-entry capsule containing the precious cargo parachuted into a landing zone in the rural inner Mongolia on the yesterday after being released into the Earth's orbit by the Change A6. According to media sources, the re-entry module successfully landed in a designated zone in China's northern Inner Mongolia region just after 2 p.m. local time. A live stream showed the module touching down via a parachute to a round of applause in the mission control room. A search team located the module minutes after its landing. The live stream showed a worker carrying out checks on the module which lay on a grassland beside a Chinese flag. The successful mission is a key milestone in China's mission to establish the country as the dominant space power and comes as a number of countries, including the United States, also ramp up on their own loon exploration programs. Time for a short commercial break. More world news coming on the other side. On the road to the White House tonight, President Biden and former President Donald Trump are set to face off this week in the first presidential debate of the cycle as the nation prepares for a rematch of the 2020 race. The debate hosted at CNN's Atlanta studios on Thursday is the first between a sitting president and a former president and marks the first debate for both men in the 2024 race. Tonight, just three days away from that crucial first debate, both campaigns are preparing very differently. President Biden hunkered down at Camp David, huddling with advisors with no public events scheduled this week. He's now a convicted felon. While his campaign is out with a new ad highlighting former President Trump's legal problems, a senior Biden advisor tells the president is expected to be increasingly punchier against Trump and that it's a moment where the campaign hopes to break through to a larger audience that has yet to tune in to the election. Leading Biden's debate prep is former chief of staff Ron Klain. A source familiar with the preparations tells that Biden's personal lawyer Bob Bauer is playing Trump during the prep sessions, reprising his role from 2020. 
It's a stark contrast from former President Trump, who's holding informal policy discussions with advisors, but no mock debates, while still holding public events. Tonight, the former president is fundraising in Louisiana after campaigning in Pennsylvania over the weekend, mocking his opponent for not leaving Camp David. He's sleeping now because they want to get him good and strong. Trump teasing that he's already chosen his running mate and says the person will likely attend the debate in Atlanta. In my mind, yeah. Do they know? No, nobody knows. Among the top debate topics expected, the economy, immigration, and reproductive rights. The Biden-Harris campaign is traveling across the U.S. to discover reproductive rights just three days before the first 2024 debate between President Joe Biden and the former President Donald Trump. Vice President Kamala Harris will visit Maryland, Arizona and key battleground states to mark the second anniversary of the Dobbs v. Jackson ruling. Tonight, on the two-year anniversary of the Supreme Court decision that overturned Roe v. Wade, the battle over abortion rights taking center stage once again in the 2024 campaign. In the case of the stealing of reproductive freedom from the women of America, Donald Trump is guilty. The Biden-Harris campaign using the anniversary to hammer former President Trump for nominating the three Supreme Court justices that helped overturn Roe. Biden saying in a statement, if given the chance, there is no question Trump will ban abortion nationwide with or without the help of Congress. The campaign mobilizing Vice President Harris and First Lady Jill Biden, rallying supporters in swing states. Donald Trump handpicked three members of the United States Supreme Court because he intended for them to overturn Roe v. Wade. And as he intended, they did. So it was premeditated. The Biden team also releasing a new ad featuring a woman who says she was denied abortion treatment in Louisiana. He's now a convicted felon. Trump thinks he should not be held accountable for his own criminal actions, but he will let women and doctors be punished. Former President Trump, whose voice concerned that abortion is a liability for Republicans in November, is doing something of a political high wire act on the issue, taking credit for overturning Roe and saying the states should decide abortion rights though he is yet to say how he will vote as a Florida resident on that state's ballot measure to ensure abortion access and has not taken a position on access to abortion medications. And Trump is not supporting a national ban, as many conservatives want to see. We did something that was amazing. The big problem was it was caught up in the federal government, but the people will decide and that's the way it should be. In the two years since the Dobbs decision, which overturned Roe, abortion rights have appeared on the ballot in seven states and won every time. And data from Planned Parenthood Action Fund shows nearly 28 million women of reproductive age live in states with partial or total bans on abortion, many of which are key swing states in this year's election. When Congress passes a law that restores the reproductive freedoms of Roe, our President Joe Biden will sign it into law. The Biden-Harris campaign hopes to focus on reproductive rights, boost their campaign against Trump, who is leading the president on many other major issues, from the economy to immigration. But recent polls show abortion is the top issue for only 4% of voters. There's more than us in there are now. The ultimate salience of one of America's most divisive issues, now an open question, is this year's hotly contested election draws closer. following a severe weather conditions in the United States. A flooding emergency is overwhelming cities and towns in part of Iowa, Minnesota and South Dakota. At least two people have died in floods and hundreds have been rescued. Other parts of the country are still dealing with stifling heat wave. Tonight, a deadly flood emergency in three states. After days of heavy rain, rivers gushing over their banks and submerging entire communities. In Minnesota, the Rapidam Dam is facing imminent failure. Officials there are monitoring the buildup of debris and making plans to keep residents in the area safe. In Iowa, evacuations are underway in several counties, with several rivers forecast to hit flood stage in the coming days. The city has deployed many pumps through the area, but unfortunately, we just can't keep up with a, a river that is flowing at that pace with that much water. There's absolutely nothing we can do to stop it. 
Overnight, a train bridge connecting Iowa and South Dakota collapsing into the Big Sioux River. That is the main bridge. Got a lot of commodities and and different materials move on throughout the stage. That'll impact us for many, many months to come. Rock Valley, Iowa is underwater after a levee broke, flooding more than 500 homes and displacing 1,500 people. Crews spent the weekend trying to rescue residents. As the Midwest grapples with extreme flooding, the dangerous heat is shifting south, several cities hitting triple digits today. And the Midwest is facing another night of severe weather with the possibility of a derecho, a cluster of fast-moving and destructive thunderstorms this evening. On to the Korean Peninsula now. North Korea resumed sending hundreds of trash-carrying balloons to South Korea yesterday night, and around 100 of them landed in the country's south. The country's military says no harmful substances have been detected and that they are getting ready for loudspeaker broadcast against North Korea following the latest happenings of the incident. South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff said as of 9 a.m. Tuesday, around 350 balloons that were launched from the north on Monday night had been identified and that about 100 of them had landed in South Korean territory. The military said most of them landed in Seoul and the northern regions of Gyeonggi-do province. The trash being carried by the balloons is mostly paper and no harmful substances have been found. The military added that it is ready to begin propaganda broadcasts aimed at North Korea depending on the regime's actions. Our military is ready to implement a loudspeaker broadcast against the North immediately. We will be strategic and flexible with the situation and will begin when the instruction is given. North Korea already sent trash-carrying balloons on four occasions between May 28th and June 10th. South Korea's Ministry of Unification provided some information about those balloons. The majority of the trash was cut off waste paper, plastic and clothing scraps that seemed to have been put together for the purpose of sending, rather than regular household trash. There were also parasites found in the soil included in the trash. The ministry added that the parasites may have come from human waste while adding that there was no risk of contamination or infection. While most were carrying planned trash made for balloons, the ministry said there was also trash that may indicate the poor economic condition in the north, such as old, worn-out socks, gloves and T-shirts. Monday's balloon launch is believed to be in retaliation for the 300,000 leaflets sent by a North Korean defector organization last Thursday. Fighters for a Free North Korea, a civic group, sent dartle bills, leaflets and USBs containing South Korean dramas and songs. North Korean leader's sister Kim Yo-jong has previously warned of sending more trash balloons regarding the leaflets sent by North Korean defector organization in the South. Time for a short commercial break. More world news coming on the other side. Welcome back. After 24 days of scintillating action across the United States and the West Indies, the ICC T20 World Cup 2024 has finally reached its knockout stage. The tournament began with 20 teams, but 16 have fallen away to the side, leaving four of the best to battle it out for the place in the final. South Africa finished the Super 8 stage at the top of Group 2 and the Proteus will look to maintain their unbeaten status at the tournament when they take on Afghanistan at the Brian Lara Cricket Academy in Trinidad and Tobago tomorrow. Afghanistan booked their place in the Final Four when they overcame Bangladesh's fight in the final game of the Super 8 in St. Vincent, after scoring 115 runs with the loss of five wickets in the first innings. Afghanistan bowled out Bangladesh for 105 in a rain-affected game, securing an eight-run win through the DLS method. All hell broke loose as Afghanistan booked their ticket to the T20 World Cup semi-finals for the first time in history. The second semi-final will take place in Guan on Thursday, with unbeaten India matched up against reigning T20 World Cup champions, England. 
India ensured their spot in the semis with an impressive victory over Australia yesterday and will take on Jos Butler's side in a rematch of their one-sided contest at the most recent T20 World Cup in Australia two years ago. England cruised to a 10-wicket triumph over India at the Adelaide Oval on that occasion on their way to a second men's T20 World Cup title. And with that, we mark the end of today's bulletin. We will see you again tomorrow with the latest happenings across the globe. We'll stay tuned as Sina Maradunabi will join you shortly with the nightly business report. Thank you and have a good night.